All right, hi guys. Um, today we're going to talk about subjective and objective measures. Uh, we're going to talk about the similarities and differences between the two and common technologies used to assess each, uh, particularly in, in sports settings, but also these can be applied to clinical settings. And my objectives or for today are to give you the tools for you to understand the difference between subjective and objective measures for monitoring exercise performance, for you to identify common subjective and objective measures used to assess training load, response to training load, and performance outcomes. And I also want you to understand or be able to understand the pros and cons of using subjective and objective measures in practice. And I already know, I'm, I'm, this is about subjective and objective measures, but I tend to go off on tangents and I, I'm sure that, that there will be a lot more value in this talk than just going over objective and subjective measures. So listen closely and, and we'll get started. So first let's discuss what objective and subjective measures are. Objective measures involve impartial measurement, which innately don't contain any bias or prejudice. A few examples might be the amount of weight that you lifted in pounds or kilos, the distance you ran in meters, or how high you jumped in inches. Typically, these measures require some piece of technology or tool, such as a stopwatch, um, to collect the information. And subjective measures, on the other hand, can be influenced by the personal judgments of an observer, uh, which is you, the practitioner, or from the individual from whom you're taking the measurement from, and that would be the athlete or exerciser. These measurements are subject to interpretation and opinion. Um, a few examples of these might be rating of perceived, perceived exertion, or RPE, where an athlete says to you how hard a training session was on a scale of zero to 10, or it could be a coach's rating uh, of how the coach felt uh, a player performed, or even a coach's rating of that same exercise session, how hard he felt that the athlete performed, or how hard he felt the athlete tried in that session. Um, a non-sport example would be a teacher who gives grades, um, like, like myself. Although you, a rubric is generally followed, um, the teacher's interpretation of that rubric influences the grade that the student might get. In those examples, we touched on the two primary subjective measures that are collected in sport, which are self-report and observer report. Our coach examples were observer report, whereas the athlete examples were self-report. And that's because the athlete is reporting information about themselves, whereas the coach was reporting information about the athlete. In that, in that case, the coach is considered an observer. And as you might expect, self-report are measures that someone is reporting about themselves, just like we talked about with the athlete rating their own exertion. However, you could also have a coach give the perception of how hard the coach thought the athlete worked by having the coach fill out an RP form about that athlete. And that would be an observer report, just kind of nail it home there. And now we're gonna move on to pros and cons of each of these measures. First, let's go over a few pros and cons for object, objective measures. So for pros, the outcomes are not subject to interpretation. In other words, you either lifted 200 pounds or you didn't. You either ran five miles or you didn't. There's no interpretation there. Objective measures are oftentimes collected with technology, although they don't have to be, um, but oftentimes they are, which is a pro. If you have an athlete do a broad jump and measure that distance, that would be an example without technology. Similarly, if you had an athlete jump as high as they could using a Vertec, that would also not require technology. But today, most of these, most of these measures are collected with technology. And when there is a software platform associated with that technology, it makes accessing, organizing, and analyzing the data that you collect a lot easier. For example, if you have an athlete jump on horse plates that connects with a software platform, that athlete's jump height among a plethora of other variables that the horse plate collects will go directly into the company's software platform 
in a nice organized way and you can take it out in that way from the platform. This is becoming more commonplace with subjective measures, but generally with subjective measures, the data isn't as complex. Another uh, pro for objective measures is that they provide a common language between parties because, well, the numbers are what they are. If an athlete jumps 22.5 inches, they jumped 22.5 inches, which is not high or low and can be directly compared with other jump height numbers. Similarly, if you had athletes sprint and use timing gates to collect that information, a 10 meter sprint that was completed in 1.55 seconds is completed in 1.55 seconds. It is what it is. So if you have a bunch of objective data, you can compare the numbers to one another easily, assuming the protocol that was used to collect the data was standardized, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. Some of the cons of objective measures are that technology, although technology has a plethora of benefits, there are some not so nice things about technology. And some of those things are, well, logistically, utilizing technologies can be a little bit more complex than measuring something directly, such as with a measuring tape. Additionally, there's, there's potential for the technology hardware or software to crash. And this is largely out of your control. If this does happen, it can be frustrating and potentially result in lost data collection. And let's say there's a hardware malfunction and it's you need to get someone over to fix it and you, that could last a period of time, which may end up being a sustained period of lost data collection. Whereas if you're using a measuring tape, that's something that's easily replaceable and you can continue to collect information. Additionally, uh, with technology, you know sometimes there's a lack of control, which can be a hard thing. Uh, the technology companies can change their formulae. There can be upgrades in accuracy or reliability of the te technology, among a variety of other things. And these are great uh, overall. But at the same time, these changes can affect the longitudinal accuracy of objective measures, at least when using technology. And I'm a huge fan of using technology. I use it for almost everything. Um, but it's important to consider how the objective data can be affected so that you as a practitioner can consider it in your interpretations of the data that you're collecting. And now th this is kind of true with, with all measures, moving on to the next con, but if, if the data collection processes are not standardized, it's easy to misinterpret information. And let's say that you have someone perform a one, one rep max of back squats. One time, they, they don't do any warm-up set and just go for it. The second time, they have a dynamic warm-up and progressively add weight until they reach their 1RM. If you're just looking at the objective measure or the weight lifted, it may be a misrepresentation of the athlete's actual progress specific to back squat 1RM because the conditions in which he or she performed the test were not the same. And this isn't related, but, but it's making me think about other potential issues with objective or subjective data collection with technologies, which is particularly true when a technology device is self-service. This is because the data goes direct, with, with technology, the data goes directly through the technology software platform, and there's really not much control that you have over that. So for example, let's say you have two athletes, Kate and Jimmy. You have Kate and Jimmy jump on force plates while you're coaching other athletes uh, somewhere else in the weight room. And you know you gotta pick your profile, uh, pick your athlete profile, and then when you jump, the data will collect under your profile and that'll go to the software cloud. And then you as a practitioner have access to that information. But let's say that Jimmy uh, forgets to switch athlete profiles in the software um, before he jumps. So he mistakenly collects his data under Kate's name. If you don't catch that mistake, you may misrepresent Kate's data because you're actually using a combination of Kate and Jimmy's data. So although the numbers are objectively accurate, maybe you know 22.5 inches was was what Jimmy jumped. That's fine. It's 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 the wrong person's data that you'll be displaying. So if you have the reason why I bring this up is because if you have a solid sense of awareness of the potential things that could happen when using technology to collect information regardless of objective versus subjective measures, uh, 
then you'll have a better understanding of what to look out for when applying these methodologies in practice. And anyways, um, the last con that, that, that we're going to talk about here is, or well, well, with using objective measures, is the lack of depth that they convey. For example, let's say that you lifted 200 pounds on the bench press, which was 100% of your one repetition maximum or one RM, which we've talked about a little bit already when you started the program. Well, you know, was it a smooth rep? Was it was it ugly? Uh, if it was smooth and fast, that may represent something completely different uh, than a rep that was performed slowly and with gross form. And objective measures don't don't really capture that type of information oftentimes. And there are other pros and cons, cons that aren't on this list, but let, let's move on to subjective measures. And like I said, um, I'm already kind of going off on tangents here, uh, and I apologize for that. So like objective measures, subjective measures also have pros and cons. And but before moving on, and I know I've said this a million times in our class, uh, is that I want to say that it is that nearly everything we talk about is is temporal uh, in nature. This is one thing. This is one of the reasons why you don't or we don't focus on memorizing a bunch of stuff because fifty of the fifty to seventy five percent of the things that you memorize will probably end up being different five to ten years from now. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we talk about these pros and cons, I want you to focus on thinking critically about why and how you would integrate these measures in practice and not focus so much on some of the intricate details. Technology will evolve, implement, implementation strategies of these measures will change, and commonalities in sport and exercise will also change, among a host of other things um, as time moves forward. So keep that in mind when we're reviewing this stuff. So pros of subjective measures. The first is that they tend to be less expensive, both from a time allocation standpoint and from a financial standpoint. We went over internal and external loads already, so let's pick a couple metrics uh, that represent internal load. Uh, there's rating of perceived, perceived exertion, or RPE, and heart rate, let's say. Heart rate belts can cost $100 a piece, uh, which doesn't include the price of the hardware, or uh, the software that, that you're using to collect that information. And you would also have to run the software from a, from a time standpoint and deal with replacing batteries potentially, ensuring all the heart rate belts are assigned all the time, among various other tasks to ensure that the data collection is streamlined. Whereas with RPE, you might just send out a Google Sheets link or a Google Forms survey uh, to the athletes to collect RPE, and that's completely free uh, from a financial perspective. And aside from the initial setup of orchestrating uh, that process in its entirety, the time demand involved with data collection is, is not very high. And another pro of subjective measures are, are that they're usually pretty simple to implement, particularly if technology isn't being used. For example, RPE, you could collect it using pen and paper. You could even just ask questions to people in, perpet, in person. Some, object, some objective measures are easy to collect too. Uh, for example, if you're using a stopwatch to time someone running. Again, the, I wanna, these are just generalities. More often than not, um, subjective measures are easier to implement, but objective measures can be easy to implement too. And that goes for all the things that we're discussing here. By definition, uh, perceptions are not objective. So one of the cons of objective measures is that they lack depth. And that's where subjective measures come in. You can evaluate others' perceptions and feelings, which can contribute to performance and health outcomes. And I think that the placebo effect is a good example of this. There's a robust body of evidence uh, which infers that believing that something will work makes it more likely to work compared with not thinking that that thing will work. Uh, for example, imagine I give you a drink, uh, it's a green drink, and, and tell you that it will make you run faster after you drink it. And if you believe me, you'll probably run faster. And if you don't believe me, you probably won't. Another pro of subjective measures is that you can get information that pertains to exactly what you're trying to assess. 
Now, responses will differ based on how the question is interpreted by the person that you're asking it to, um, as well as the individual's perceptions of, of what's going on with when that question is asked. But you could simply ask someone, how hard was that? Instead of inferring how hard it was from an objective measure that was collecting, you have a more direct answer. Now let's go over a few cons of subjective measures. Because subjective measures involve personal judgment, directly comparing outcomes between ind individuals is generally not advised. Now, there are strategies to put everyone's response or everyone's responses on a level playing field once you have a decent amount of data on each individual. For example, you could look at how, how different one individual's response was relative to their normal response and compare that to another individual's response relative to his or her normal response. And yeah, it's getting a little bit convoluted, but for example, imagine you collect RPE after training. John gives a RPE of five out of 10. It was moderately hard. And Rachel gives uh, an RPE of seven out of 10, which is, which is, appears to be harder than John's rating. And they perform the same workout. Now, in order to interpret that, you, you'll need to know that maybe John usually gives a four out of 10 and Rachel usually gives a six out of 10. And so maybe you have an understanding that, you know, for both individuals, the workout today was slightly harder than normal. And if you compare across individuals, if you compare John to Rachel, or John's five out of 10 to Rachel's seven out of 10, it would appear that Rachel's seven out of 10 was harder than John's five out of 10 which may not actually be the case. But what you do know by understanding, you know, their, their normal responses to those situations was that for each of them individually, uh, it was a little bit harder. And when you compare them to each other, you know that between them both, the session was a little bit harder. Not sure if that makes sense, uh, but hopefully, hopefully uh, you get it a little bit. Another con of subject of measures is that they are prone to biases. Let's again say you're collecting RPE. If athletes think that giving a low RPE will make you, the practitioner, think that they didn't work hard, they may decide to give higher RPEs to avoid that scenario. Similarly, if you're collecting, let's say, daily well-being information with an, athlete, with an athlete on game day, and that athlete believes that giving a low well-being score will influence their, their game performance like or their mindset before the game, which could Im impact their game performance, they may uh, lie and give better well-being values than, than those that he or she is actually feeling. Overall, you just need to consider the biases um, that are present in subjective measures and try to provide a few examples of that. Another con, and particularly uh, when technologies are not used, is that data management can be more difficult. So if you do collect RPE using pen and paper or asking questions, the collection of that information may be a little bit more difficult to look after and organize compared with, let's say, you know, a heart rate belt, for example. The heart rate belt may automatically send the data to a place like a cloud where, where it's organized and accessible and viewable and you can visualize it, whereas you may have to do a little bit more legwork to make sure that that RPE cl data collection that you're doing on pen and paper by asking people questions directly is in a format that you can use. That may happen. You might enter information to Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or however you want to do it, but it, it may require a little bit more legwork if you're not using technology. So those last two slides were, were pretty long, uh, but I think that we're going to fly through uh, some of the next few. And what we're looking at here is a few common objective and subjective training mode measures. Uh, used in sport and clinical settings. So for objective measures, GPS units, accelerometers, and heart rate belts are generally used. And in sport, the metrics that are evaluated are generally dependent on the demands of the sport. But, you know, I should say generally practitioners use some of the metrics listed in, in that section on the left there. And those include, you know, accelerations, de-accelerations, de both in, in the number of them and, and magnitudes, you know, peak speed, um, training impulse or TRIMP, um, 
from an internal load perspective, which is heart rate, um, among others, like perhaps uh, the amount of time you spend above your anaerobic threshold and, and a variety of other things. And I, I, the way that this is laid out, I kind of make it seem like there's, there's a, a big difference between general uh, or clinical settings and, and sport environments. But really, uh, the metrics are very similar, if not the same in most instances. So I just want to segregate it out to give, you know, if, if, if you were going into clinical practice or, or general or working generally not in sport, just to give some segregation there. But in reality, you know, this is neither of those categories are mutually exclusive and there's tons of carryover uh, between each. So some things you might see more often in, in clinical practice are use of accelerometers, oftentimes wrist worn, um, like you know the, the Fitbits uh, and Apple watches and other things like that, that, that are counting steps and, and things like that. Um, duration is, is another one. Uh, heart rate belts are also, also used uh, clinically oftentimes. And I really don't know why I tried to segregate them out uh, now that I think more about it, but it is what it is. So we'll roll with it. Um, for, for subjective measures, we have things like rating of perceived exertion, um, repetitions in reserve. And that's, that's a number that represents how many repetitions you have left in the tank uh, after a set of exercise. So if you perform um, a set of exercise and the repetitions in reserve is two, you probably could have irked out two more repetitions of that exercise with good form. Then you might also have perceived movement quality, um, either in the through the eyes of the athlete or through the eyes of the practitioner. And those are in sport. And there are a plethora of patient reported outcome measures or uh, PROMs used in, in clinical contexts and visual analog scales are, are commonly used as well. And now we're moving on to common measures used to evaluate the training load response, um, which is different than training load. And this is an important distinction. Uh, there are measures that quantify the training load that is imposed. And then there are measures which aim to quantify the response to that imposed training load. We're talking about the response measures here. So in sport, uh, there are objective measures like vertical jump height and other jumping metrics to quantify neuromuscular response to training load. Uh, the way that practitioners tend to use this information is a reduction in, in jump height could indicate a reduction in neuromuscular readiness or could indicate neuromuscular fatigue imposed by training loads. Practitioners will also look at different phases of the jump to better understand how an individual is adapting to training, but we'll, we'll get more into that when we talk about force plates a little bit later on. Heart rate variability or HRV, um, movement velocity, um, which is typically captured with linear position transducers. Some of you might be familiar with companies like Gym Aware or Push. Um, there, there are tons of others um, that track how fast or have the capacity to track how fast uh, you're moving things or you're moving yourself. And then uh, body weight and body composition are oftentimes used to assess responses to training demands. And within that, hydration uh, comes into play also. Now, in clinical practice, um, more often than sport, I would say, just because of the setting is a little bit different, levels of certain metabolites uh, or metabolites in the blood, including creatine kinase, um, which is an indicator of muscle damage, lactate, and various vitamins uh, and minimal minerals um, and is used. Um, but that's also used in sport. Again, there, there's a lot of carryover, so don't, don't focus on, on the distinctions. Also in clinical practice, a little bit more common are uh, electrocardiograms or ECGs and EMGs are also used, as well as sleep act actigraphy. Um, and again, that's similar similar to sport. Sleep act actigraphy or actigraphy in general is, is pretty much, you're wearing a, an accelerometer on your wrist uh, that looks like a watch and you're wearing it at night. And the movement that occurs uh, with that watch is, is used to assess sleep patterns. And subjective measures include various perceptions and well-being, including items relating to stress, energy, mood, sleep, muscle soreness, and, and a bunch of other things. 
And there, there are a lot of validated well-being questionnaires out there um, for use with, with athletes, including those listed um, to, to the right on, in the subjective measures area. Yeah, all right, I do have a laser pointer thing. Um, Okay, so similar to uh, the training load quantification, there are a bunch of different patient reported outcome measures that are used in clinical practice, which are dependent on context. I, I don't have it listed here, but there, there are also a ton of observer reported measures too. Think about what it's like when you go to your doctor, they ask you a bunch of questions and you give them answers. Similar things like that happen in general and clinical settings uh, to assess training load responses. I don't know, training load and training load responses aren't generally assessed uh, to a high degree in, in the settings, at least that I'm thinking about. But in general, there's a lot of uh, observer rated uh, metrics that are being collected. And now we have uh, performance measures. So we went over training load, we went over training load response, and now we're going through performance. So once again, for all these measures, the context is is extremely important. Uh, if you're a baseball athlete, oh man, my my pointer. If you're a baseball athlete, the measures used to quantify your performance may be very different than a hockey player, which may be different from, from a basketball player, and so on. A few common objective measures used in sport are, you know, sprint speeds, jumps, conditioning metrics like VO2 max, which could either be actually collected with a metabolic card or, or estimated through like a, a, a beep test where you're running back and forth um, with a cadence increase uh, for as long as you can. In general or clinical practice, you know, steps taken, duration of physical activity, body composition, and, and a variety of functional for, for uh, sorry, well, and a variety of functional performance tests are used. Again, there's a ton of crossover. So, uh, for subjective measures, self-report performance measures are somewhat uncommon. Uh, there are a few things that the observer or practitioner may collect, which could be perceived movement quality of an athlete or perceived speed of movement. I oftentimes hear coaches say that a player looks fast or slow, um, which would be a subjective measure um, that is observer rated uh, for performance. In general or clinical practice, perceived duration of physical activity, such as that on, on a questionnaire, um, various you know quality of life scales, pain and function scales, among a bunch of other things um, are used to quantify performance uh, from a subjective measure standpoint. And now uh, we're done with going over common measures. There will probably be change to these over time. And I just want to throw out a bunch of ideas to spur some critical thinking. Now let's go through a few examples of, of using subjective and objective measures in practice. Now what we see here is we have three athletes, Frank, Jenna, and Julian. Let's say they're on a soccer team and uh, they wear GPS units uh, during games. In this report, uh, we're looking at the amount of distance each of them covered at high speeds for the first four games of the season. When you're looking at this table, each row is one game. And at the bottom of the report, we have their year average over uh, the 16 games of the season. Let's say there's 16 games. Now, if, if you were a coach looking at this report, what might you say about the efforts of these athletes? Were they consistent in all the games? And how do they compare against one another? And we're gonna do this a bunch. Uh, I want you to pause the video, take a minute and think about that. And we'll, we'll discuss that in a moment. Okay, so I hope that, I hope that you did that and we're back. And for me, uh, I noticed three things primarily. The first is that Frank, Jenna, and Julian were all relatively consistent with the amount of distance they covered in each game or in each of the four games. And all these differences or all these distances align with, with their season averages. So they're kind of just doing the same thing every game. With the exception, and this is the second thing I noticed, of Jenna 
game two, where she covered 425 meters of high intensity running. What, what could have happened there? Well, you know, maybe she got hurt. Uh, the GPS unit ran out of batteries or it came off of her gear. There could be a bunch of things that went on there. The third thing uh, that I noticed is that Julian covers the most distance, followed by Jenna, followed by Frank. And now what could explain these differences? Well, m you know, maybe the numbers tell the whole story, right? Julian covers more distance than Jenna, who covers more dif distance than Frank running at high speeds. But what else could be happening? Let's think about this, all right? What, what if Frank has a slower peak speed than Jenna? who has a slower peak speed than Julian. Well, if you notice on the bottom, high speed running distance is greater than 20 kilometers an hour or 12.5 miles per hour. So if Julian is, is faster and high intensity distance has a threshold of greater than 20 kilometers per hour, maybe Julian is just covering more different distance because he's faster or a very unlikely scenario could be that the units are placed on the gear differently for each player. Or, you know, maybe their their orientation is different, which affects the results. Or maybe Julian moves his sensor to a different location on, on his body uh, because it's more comfortable. In any case, there's potential for this report not only to be misleading, but also screw up data analyses, uh, and particularly in Jenna's case, if that data is being used to give her averages or averaging with team averages or anything else, it can affect the, the information. And now we're looking at the exact same thing, but we're using a subjective measure, RPE. Now, again, I wanna ask you, if you were a coach looking at this report, what might you say about the efforts of these athletes? Were they consistent in all the games? And how do they compare against one another? Again, let's let's pause the visit, pause the video, take a minute, and think about that, and, and we'll discuss in a moment. Now, now we're back. We're going to talk um, once again. I want to direct your attention to game two. Julian and Frank's efforts appear to be higher than Jenna's. However, both Frank and Julian didn't rate their exertions as high as they do normally based on their 16 game year average. Jenna, on the other hand, worked harder than she normally does, at least slightly compared with her average, right? We got 5.5 here, we got six here, we got nine here, we got seven here. So worked less than, less hard, I guess, than normal. We got seven, nine, less hard than normal. We got 5.5, six, harder than normal. So if you were to compare, or if you were to just look at this game and the RPEs of that game, you would think that everyone worked just as hard as one another because there's a seven, there's a six, there's a seven, right? They're all more or less the same. Um, when that may actually be very far from the case. And now let's just look at Jenna over time. On the surface, with her five, six, five, six um, in order. It looks like Jenna didn't try very hard in any of these games, especially when you compare her, her numbers to Frank's and Julian's. We could make the assumption that Jenna hasn't tried hard all year, which is unlikely, but could be possible. Or, and a more probable answer to this, is that her perception of exertion is different than the other two folks. So although they may all have been giving a near full effort, Jenna's interpretation or mindset surrounding RPE and the way that she perceives that is different than the rest of the players. And I, I wanna point out that objective and subjective, subjective meta, measures well, are not better or worse than one another. and shouldn't be treated as, as opposing or oppositions. They're, they're quite complementary to one another. So when you have an objective and subjective measure, the picture gets a lot clearer, a lot cleaner. For example, 
if Julian's RPU is down, let's say, and his high high speed uh, distance was up, that could potentially indicate that he has undergone an increase in fitness, or maybe he was more ready to perform that day because he didn't have to try as hard, according to his RPE, to cover even more distance than he usually does from the high high speed distance variable. And one of the overarching themes uh, with all this stuff is that context matters. How information is viewed and how it's relayed to others is extremely important for enhancing decision-making practices and improving performance outcomes ultimately uh, for the athletes. And now um, if you're in my class, uh, you know what to do here. Uh, this is the question of the day. Um, it is, if you could be a cartoon character for a week, who would you be? For me, I'm thinking I, maybe like Sonic the Hedgehog. He's really fast and I've never been fast. Um, so I think that that would be pretty cool. Um, but let me know your answer uh, in the Google Sheets and um, and yeah, and, and we'll move forward. So before we move on, we're going to do the same thing that we just did with training load response measures and then performance measures. But uh, for this to make sense, let's talk a little bit about heart rate variability um, or HRV. There are a lot of metrics used to quantify HRV, and it's important that you know which metric or combination of metrics are being used to give the HRV value or score um, that you're seeing. Um, and that will likely depend on the hardware and, and, and the software that, that you're using. Um, to collect that information. And I think that the most often used or the primary me metric uh, used to quantify HRV is something called uh, the root mean square of successive differences um, or RMSSD. Think of, and let's think about what this means, okay? Uh, think of each of those blue lines that you see, each of these peaks as heartbeats. What we're doing is we're measuring the time in milliseconds that occurs between each heartbeat. Then, after that, so what we're looking at, so 859 milliseconds, 793 milliseconds, 726 milliseconds uh, between between those um, between those heartbeats. Then we're looking at the variability between those beat to beat time differences. In this case, the difference between 859 and 793 milliseconds is 66 milliseconds. And the difference between 793 and 726 is 67 milliseconds. We then apply those numbers to the formula above uh, up here, which is used to get a single value that represents those the totality of those differences uh, over whatever the time course is that you measure the HR, uh, the heart rate, which could be two minutes, it could be five minutes. Some, um, like for example, if you have a watch and you're wearing it overnight, you know, there are a lot of heartbeats that occur there. Um, companies aggregate that information different ways. They might say, oh, we're taking HRV from the last two minutes, you know, uh, before you woke up, or we took it two minutes at, at 4 a.m. You know, there are a bunch of different ways to, to do it. Um, but that's that's what HRV is generally, and it indicates the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous systems. Think of uh, sympathetic as active and parasympathetic as, as relaxed. Uh, the sympathetic system is utilized to a high degree during stressful events, like such as exercise, whereas parasympathetic is more active uh, when things are calm. HRV reflects the balance between those systems um, with a higher HRV generally indicating parasympathetic dominance with lower HRV indicating sympathetic dominance. And that's just a general kind of poor man's overview of it. And now let's move on to the training load uh, response examples. So the first one we're gonna look at is is uh, relating to HRV, which is an objective measure of training load response. This table is the same as the last, except the values for Frank, Jenna, and Julian are HRV values. 
instead of the weeks on the far left, uh, we're looking at the number of days after the game they just played, let's say. So they played a game. Imagine they just played a game. Uh, the first row is the day after the game, or GD, which is game day, plus one. So one day after the game. And the next row, GD plus two, is two days after the game, and so on. And if, you're, if you were a coach looking at this report, what might you say about the recoveries of these athletes? Who is the most recovered after four days? How do the athletes' recoveries compare to one another? Again, pause the video and think about that for a second, and I'm gonna start talking again uh, in a few seconds. All right, I'm, I'm gonna talk again. So my first thought is we have no idea who's more recovered because we don't know what their normal HRV uh, values are in these scenarios. And uh, you'll notice I removed the averages. So that's the first thing I noticed. I have no idea what's going on. But some things that we can see are that Frank, his HRV is trending up. This is a typical recovery profile follow, following a stressful event uh, with a decrease in stress following the event. So for example, you know, you play a game which is really, really stressful, really hard, really taxing, and then you might see a drop in, in HRV. Um, and then as you recover, as your body, as training is, is less strenuous or you have off days, um, the HRV will, will recover um, to, to a higher value or increase to a higher value. So what we might presume is that Frank's training stress was high during the game and likely uh, the next few days had had a far lower training loads um, so that, and, and that's why his, his HRV is, is going back up. And now we know that Jenna is more or less stagnant uh, in her HRV values. She either, now there are a couple different things that could have happened. She either recovered really well right off the bat from the game and was fully covered, uh, fully recovered entering day two post game, or she's maybe she hasn't recovered at all and she's still in the tank. Like these values, these HRV values are low for her. So she has not recovered at all, even four days after the game, or maybe she didn't even play in the game. So we know that Julian started on an upward trend, started going up a little bit, very, very slightly. Uh, and over the past two days, or GD plus three and GD plus four, he's gone through something that has potentially hampered his recovery, whether it's hard workouts, he's, he's, um, he's not sleeping well, various things um, could, could affect that number. And again, I wanted to remove, I removed the averages because I wanted to illustrate the concept that context uh, is really meaningful, regardless of objective or subjective measure. If we don't know the averages or some other meaningful aggregation of the HRV values for these athletes, how, how are we supposed to know whether this, their responses are normal for them? Well, you know, we don't. So with that aside, now let's think about a few things that could impact these, these numbers. Let's, all right, HRV, is, is it being collected with a watch or a chest strap? That's pretty important because you know, those, the validity and reliability between those two options can, can differ. Um, and similarly, what's the validity and reliability of the device that they're using to collect the information? Even within the watch category, let's say, different devices um, have, have different uh, abilities to capture accurate and reliable information um, using HRV values. Another question that comes to mind, for me at least, is, is when is the HRV being collected? Um, not only, I mean, we're assuming that these are collected in the morning, um, first thing in the, or the values are coming up first thing in the morning, and they're not being, because HRV can be used uh, as, like, during exercise, post-exercise to see different things, but we're assuming that this is a, a training load response indicator. So, so again, when is HRV being, being collected? Is this stop, well, is the software displaying a number which looks at HRV over a two minute period first thing in the morning? Or is there some algorithm that runs in the middle of the night to collect the information? And what I'm getting at is that research shows that there are differences in these data collection strategies for HRV. So if you don't know how and when it's being collected, you know, that, that could be an issue. 
And when we went over HRV, we went over RM, RM SSD. Uh, so another question I have is what metric is being used to quantify HRV? There are various metrics, um, including the one we went over. It's important to know which metric or combination of metrics are being considered uh, for this value. And then uh, another question, throughout these game days, so GD plus one, GD plus two, plus three, et cetera, was there physical activity on, the, on any of these days? Um, what about other stressful activities? Pretty much we need to know what was going on in order to interpret what these HRV values mean. All of these things matter and provide context for our use of this information and in practice. And now we might also need to think about a few issues that, that could arise uh, from this data collection. So let's say that this data was collected with with a watch and the data goes into the some software platform in space, right? Uh, that aggregates the information and gives you a reading. Some apps give you recommendations on what to do from a training perspective based on this number. And oftentimes within these apps, you can't delete or change uh, this number, this HRV number that you get, at least in, in most platforms. And this may throw off uh, averages, your HRV averages in the software and throw off uh, recommendations. For example, uh, I haven't, like for myself, uh, this is not related to HRV, uh, but, it's, but it's something a little bit different. And with one of these apps, uh, one of these watches that go to an app and all that stuff, I was wearing a heart rate uh, watch, you know, it was collecting heart rate, uh, I was wearing it for a while and it was going fine. And at one point it picked up an inaccurate heart rate maximum value for me when I was just walking around. Uh, the company uses that heart rate maximum value to calculate my, my training load. So my heart rate max was 175, give or take. And then after walking around and this inaccurate value comes up, my new heart rate max is 200 and something. So in reality, it's, it's 175, it's not 200. And I, the user, have no con didn't have any control over changing that value. So when I exercise from that point forward, I never got close to, to the training loads that I did have uh, because, because of my new heart rate maximum, which was now higher than the one that I had before. So this made it appear that my training lo load was really low when it when in actuality, it was really high. Um, the reason why it was appearing to be really low is because that new value of 200, I was never getting close to that value. So on paper, it appeared that I was look, I was working uh, at very low intensities when in reality, I was working at really high intensities. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but it's something to, to look out for in, in general, not just about HRV, but just um, with how your information is, is being aggregated, collected, and, and what it all means. And it, in all honesty, sometimes with, with these applications, it gets really difficult to diagnose a problem because, you know, the athlete is not you and you know yourself really well, but you don't necessarily know all the things that are going on with the athlete. And you have to ask very complex questions to get at an issue they're experiencing with a self-service piece of hardware or software. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I digress. Uh, I got off on a tangent uh, again. Uh, so... Some questions to think about with HRV specifically is what would you do when an athlete feels like crap? Let's say according to subjective wellness, but HRV is high or HRV indicates that they're, you know, in prime mode to train. Or what about the other way around? HRV is really low, but the athlete says they are feeling great. You know, what do you do then? You'll see readiness scores that are based almost exclusively on HRV and other objective indicators um, collected via these mechanisms, um, and they not be 100% uh, accurate or transparent regarding how, how the readiness score is calculated, uh, but the readiness score is still telling an athlete whether or not to train. And my question to you is, do you think that this is appropriate? Uh, why or why not? And, and what would you do about it? Um, these are just questions, food, food for thought, things that are running through my head when we're talking about this and are important things to consider just in general. Now uh, we're looking at an athlete's readiness scores instead of HRV values. Um, this is the same table as before. Uh, 
the athletes played in the game and we're looking at game day plus one or the day after the game, game day plus two or two days after the game and so on. And now these readiness scores, let's just say they're, they're out of 40 points uh, and they're, they're based on, you know, uh, perceived sleep quality, energy level, stress uh, and excitement for training, right? And they add up to a readiness score out of 40. And I'm gonna ask you the same questions. Uh, if you were a coach looking at this report, what might you say about the recoveries of these athletes? Who's the most recovered after, after four days? And how, how do the athletes recoveries compare to one another? Again, just pause the video um, and have a little thought about it. It's a good exercise and we'll compare notes. I'll start talking in a little bit. Okay, so we're back. Uh, my first note uh, is that personally, I have no idea who's more recovered because we don't know what their normal wellness scores in these scenarios look like. And I did this, the reason why I did this is just show, you know, subjective, objective, without context, uh, it's difficult to interpret things. So we know that Frank and Jenna are both trending up in these recovery scores. And these are typical rec recovery profiles, which to me indicates a, you know, a potential good sign. We know that Julian is more or less stagnant throughout the four days following the game. And similar to Jenna's scenario in, in the last one, um, he either recovered really well right, right off the bat and was fully recovered uh, entering day two post game, or he still hasn't recovered at all, or he didn't play in the game. And like I said, the situation is very similar to, to the last, but now let's think about the things that could affect these numbers. And the things that affect these values might be a little bit different than the things that affect the HRV readings. For example, with the HRV, the data is the data. It's objective. Here, we need to consider the inter-individual or between athlete differences in perceptions of recovery. With HRV, the athlete may have physiological norms for themselves in given scenarios or just in general. Whereas with this subjective data, the athlete has perception norms for themselves. In both of these instances, the normative values could be context dependent and they could change over time. It's an important thing to note. We also need to consider the potential user error or recording error in the data entry. For example, did the athlete misclick an answer um, if they received the questionnaire, let's say, to their phone? There's a lot of power in the athlete's hands with this, with this method, um, which can lead to issues. Um, as a class, you know, in our class, we saw this with our Google Sheets implementation. And for those that don't know, you know, we have this Google Sheet and every morning uh, before class, everyone's filling out information about their, about their readiness exercise and their injury status and a variety of other things. And before I applied data validation to that sheet, um, which is a way of ensuring that data entry is, is consistent um, or falls within certain guidelines. When people were, were filling out their injury status, we saw the word limited um, spelled in a few interesting uh, different ways, which, affects, which affected our aggregation and interpretation of the information that we were collecting. And all I wanna point out is similarly, these athletes can make mistakes with, with data entry that can affect, that can affect things. That is not true uh, with HRV. So another question, where was the questionnaire filled out? Was it in the presence of others or was it filled out on their own, on their phones? Like some uh, organizations, some teams, some environments have communal iPads that people fill things out on. If it's a group setting, there could be an additional peer influence that might need to be considered. For example, if, if I'm looking over your shoulder, um, in, in watching what you're doing, are, are you going to do something different? Or, you know, if someone, if you see someone else give a certain number, or is that going to influence the number that you give? Now, this is not, not an issue, um, with, with HRB, but it could be an issue, um, with, uh, percept, uh, perceived data. Another thing to consider is how much thought did each athlete give to their responses? Um, do they have an agenda of sorts and, and are they lying for some perceived gain they may get by giving a certain answer? Um, th there are a ton of reasons why an athlete may lie about their answers, um, whether it be sub subconsciously or consciously. 
And we spoke about a few of those reasons um, a few slides back, you know, whether they think that, you know, it, it'll have meaning regarding their playing time or your perception of them um, or their participation in training, you know, they can, there are a bunch of different things that can affect that. Now, one of the nice things about most streams of subjective data collection is that the athlete, if the athlete did make a mistake, you or the athlete has the ability to change it oftentimes. Um, but at the same time, you still need to identify uh, that there may be an inaccuracy to correct the inaccuracy that, that may exist. And just in general, I think that education is huge when it comes to subjective measures. If athletes know why their responses are important uh, for their benefit, they're more likely to give honest responses, at least in my experiences. This is also why trust and rapport is essential. You need to be clear about what information is going to whom and how the information is being used. Because if for some reason an athlete, let's say, gets playing time removed due to their responses, you're in trouble. Answers will, will be inaccurate and, and misrepresentative moving forward. And not only for that athlete, because the information will, will circulate around a team environment uh, and influence responses of others as well. In, in other words, uh, there are significant factors outside of the data collection in itself that warrant consideration when implementing subjective measures particularly. And we've talked a lot about data and data collection. I've said this a bunch in class, but I wanna reiterate that it is never a good idea to make decisions based on the data that you see alone. Uh, the data should be used, uh, in my opinion, to create discussions and drive conversations with the athletes, fellow practitioners, and coaches. Um, and if, if you end up making decisions based solely off of the numbers you see, you may end up actually doing a disservice to the team uh, as a whole or just the athlete um, based on some of the limitations and the things that we talked about uh, throughout this talk. So now let's transition to performance. We still have our athletes, Frank, Jenna, and Julian. Now we're looking at jump heights uh, in inches over time. Notice the weak number on the left here. Excuse me. The athletes had, had jump heights recorded once every four to five weeks over a season. Again, if you were a coach looking at this report, what might you say about physical performance of these athletes? How do they compare to one another? And how did each progress throughout the season? And again, try to pause the video and, and think about your answers uh, for a second and I'll start talking again in, in a couple seconds. Okay, so we're back. Let's go through these athletes one by one briefly. Frank, right? He goes up for a bit, then he starts going down. Jenna, you know, she's consistent and goes up a lot from week five to week nine. Uh, that's what I get generally, then goes back down. And Julian, he's kind of, I have no idea what's going on with him. He's kind of all over the place. Looks to have an average at a, you know, about 20, a little bit over 20 maybe. So who would you say is the most powerful according to these numbers? And for me, um, you know, the, the, there's a list of questions that I would have to make. And, and I encourage you, maybe, all right, maybe come up with a list of questions you'd be interested to know um, to make a more accurate prediction for, for how these athletes performed over time and who's the most powerful. In other words, what information do you need to interpret the data better? And what do you need to be confident in your, in your assessment of how these athletes are doing? Again, pause the video. And if you don't write down your own answers, at least think about them. I'm going to go through a few things that come to mind, for me at least, um, that would help me out. And yep, so pause it now. Um, if you're gonna do that, I'll talk again in a couple of seconds. All right, we're back. So the first thing that, that comes to mind for me is how is the information being collected? Uh, where are these jump heights coming from? Are they coming from a force plate, like a jump mat, a vertex? Um, in any case, it's important to know how the jump height is being calculated, as well as the strengths and limitations of the device that's being used to collect the information. 
If you don't, you may not be able to interpret the information with sufficient quality. You know, a, a, a force plate reading um, based on takeoff velocity uh, for jump height is different than what you can hit on a, on a Vertec, which is different than um, what you can get using using a jump mat, uh, which uses your, your time in the air essentially uh, to, to determine um, your, your jump height. The second thing that I'm thinking is when is the information when is the information being collected? For example, is it being collected after a warm up, uh, with no warm up, after practice, or some other time? And th the timing to me isn't isn't as important as the notion that the method of data collection needs to be consistent. If the protocol or procedure to collect the information is inconsistent. The numbers are going to come along for that ride and be inconsistent and not great indicators of performance. So if we look at Jenna, maybe she jumped before practice in week nine. And you know, she got a great jump score. And all the rest of her jumps, she jumped after practice, where you know there was a certain amount of fatigue that, that set in. Or maybe, you know, Jenna always jumped in the morning. Uh, however, when she jumped during week nine, it was the day after an easy practice, but all the other jump sessions occurred on days after games, where again, there's that overnight fatigue that, that may be compromising her performance. Another question I have, how many jumps are they doing? We need to know how the information is aggregated. Is it the best of three jumps, an average of the three jumps, or maybe they just did one jump? We need to know the typical random error in the measurement, uh, and this gives us a better sense of that. Uh, for example, how many in inches is typical for one jump to differ, I guess, from the next? If each session was one jump and the typical random error in, in jumping performance is about two inches, um, then we may not actually know if, for example, let's say Frank, right? Well, let's look here. Um, we may not know uh, whether or not Frank's jump height changed between week nine and week 18 over the latter half of the season. In general, I, I support taking an average of, of, of three jumps or, or a median of the three jumps um, just because you have better control over the variability of the task performance by including more data points. So the more jumps you do, you know, to aggregate, assuming that there's, you know, there's adequate rest in between jumps, um, I'd, I think that way, as opposed to just doing one jump. Another question I have is, what are the training statuses of these athletes? Someone new to training, let's say it's Julian, uh, may be plenty powerful, but doesn't know how to jump very well. And jumping can be a pretty complex movement, especially if, if you're not trained in jumping. So you may see number like his, uh, or numbers like his, as, as he continues to get practice with the skill in itself. His, his numbers may be fluctuating so much simply because he's still learning the mechanics of jumping. And the differences in jump heights may not be an accurate reflection of what you're trying to measure if you're trying to measure power performance. And again, I, this is kind of going back to my first one with what device is being used, but how is jump height being measured? Force plates uh, oftentimes use takeoff velocity, jump mats use the time you spend in the air. They're, and, you know, this is kind of a tangent, but there are ways to cheat uh, with the time spent in the air. Uh, and, and if the athlete is cheating, uh, their numbers may be inconsistent. For example, an athlete could have had, like, let's say that you land with substantial hip and knee flexion uh, from the jump, instead of landing with your legs more or less straight or a slight knee bend. You know, you're, you might be spending more time in the air. So if an athlete likes to try to cheat and they have more hip mobility one day compared to, to another, um, their ability to cheat well or not cheat so well could even affect their results. And I guess the, the final thing that, that I'm thinking um, is, is just thinking about other non-testing uh, related measures, non-testing related questions. I, I, I have a bunch of them and I'm not gonna go into those really, uh, but I'll list a few to give you a sense of what I'm thinking about. Um, is Frank playing more minutes per game than Jenna and Julian? You know, was Julian on and off throughout the season with injuries? Is Jenna even playing at all? Or maybe she's playing very, or maybe she's playing very consistent minutes. Uh, 
I, I don't know, but there are other non-training, uh, non-testing related variables that should probably be considered. And again, similar to the other exercises, I wanted to go through this um, to just get you thinking about all the different things that could impact a measurement, whether it be subjective or objective. The important thing that I tell people, you know, generally is to be consistent. At least if, if you're incredibly consistent with how you collect uh, the information and your approach to collecting the information, you will have accurate representations of changes over time and, compa and comparison between athletes for most subjective measures, you know, will be possible. Even if the accuracy is off, let's say, if you have a consistent procedure, you hope to be consistently incorrect or consistently off to the same magnitude, which still allows you to make inter-individual inter or between athlete um, and longitudinal or over time comparisons. Okay, now, now we're gonna go through a, a subjective performance assessment, but instead of the other subjective um, examples we, we went over, this is gonna be not subjective from the athlete's perspective, but subjective from the coach or practitioner's perspective. So maybe you do this assessment as a quick movement and strength combination screen of sorts to see if the athlete is able to maintain multi-joint function and strength over the course of a season. Um, and you tailor the program occasionally based on the results. Uh, this is a single leg squat test, let's say, and, and maybe you're looking uh, for five different things uh, as a part of this test, which results in a score out of five. Uh, you're looking for, you know, Knee, knee inversion, you're looking for heel lift when they do it, uh, the number of repetitions they can do with good form as a strength measure, um, hip internal rotation, and thoracic uh, or back flexion as indicators of performance. So you give it a score out of five based on those criteria, however you have it organized, with five being perfect. So this has already been a really long talk, so I'm just going to go over a, a few quick things uh, maybe to consider. Uh, the first being, is it just you making these assessments? If it's not just you screening every athlete every day of every year, consider the different perspectives of different observers. If you don't know the inter-rater reliability or degree of agreement between you and your buddy, you know, looking at the same athlete, then you better find out um, because let's say that your buddy is is an easier grader than you are he you know he gives five out of five way more often than you do now if you have a compilation of athletes and uh, weeks and scores um, the athletes that were observed by your buddy or your friend may appear to be performing better at the test um, when in reality it's just it's just a difference between the observer perspectives or the way that you and your friend are seeing things. Another thing to consider is are the are these things on video, uh, whether it's a single leg squat test or whatever it is using um, perceived uh, ratings of, of, of observers. Uh, the reason why is because if you video them, it gives an opportunity for multiple observers to assess the same video. And what this allows for is um, potential to average ratings or find out when there are substantial disagreements between observers and tailor the, the data or the information um, to best suit um, the collective interpretation of, of what's going on with the test. So let's say that you and, and your friend and 10 other people are rating these athletes by watching videos of them. Everyone has the same perspective, not they have the same like actual perspective from the video, um, although their perceptions may, may be different. Um, and maybe one person consistently, you know, he, he doesn't like one of the players, so he, he rates them really low and you can tease that out through, through that process. And along, the, along those same lines, you need to consider that you and all observers have biases. A few things that might influence uh, how, how you rate an athlete, let's say performing this test might be your likeness, you know, for, for the athlete. In other words, do you like the athlete as a person? If you don't, you might give them a lower score. If you really love them, then you might give them a better score without even knowing it. Another thing uh, could be 
that could influence uh, how you rate them could be the coach's expectations. For example, if an athlete is under your tutelage or supervision um, and the coach expects that an athlete is supposed to get better, um, that may affect your rating of that athlete, um, whether you know it or not, because the coach's expectations, maybe you're scared of what will happen to you if the athlete that doesn't improve and a variety of other things, a variety of other reasons. Another thing to consider is how you feel on a given day could affect the results. For example, if you feel like crap, um, you may be more prone to give worse ratings just subconsciously. Um, whereas if you're feeling great on a given day, you just may have more positive, optimistic mindset, make a better rating. And there are a bunch of others, um, but the point is you need to be aware that you and all observers have biases uh, that could impact results. And a final thing that, that I would consider is you, you should you should really consider how the data will be treated when you're no longer in that environment. Uh, for example, let's say that um, you've been uh, assessing these athletes every time for, for years, and then a new observer comes in to perform the assessments. Just like switching out one piece of technology for another, um, once a new observer starts performing these assessments, the longitudinal comparisons or comparisons over time for those athletes may, you know, the credibility may, may be sacrificed or, or the way that you interpret that information may have to be very different um, because the observers are different and the biases are different and you need to consider those things. So these are just a few things to think about um, if you're going to apply a metric or outcome um, using observer ratings. And now we're on this takeaways page and, and we, you know, we've talked a lot uh, about subjective and objective measures, but, and, and here are a few takeaways from, from the information pertaining to, to those things. Um, but, you know, we talked a, about a lot more than that and I'll let you read through uh, the take, takeaways because I don't want to just read right off the slide. So, you know, while you're doing that, maybe I'll, I'll end here and, and and take this opportunity to stress some of the more important things. Um, one of them being having standardized procedures in place to collect whatever it is you are collecting, whether it's RPE, heart rate, jump heights, wellness, or anything else, you absolutely need to have a standardized protocol for how the athletes are prepared and the data is collected. I think that a, a decent example of, of this, uh, I'm trying to think, could be uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis or BIA, um, this is uh, a method used to estimate body composition. You've probably seen scales that have like metallic uh, things on them and you can stand on it and it'll give you a body fat percentage. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the details of, of, of how that works, um, but what I'm gonna get at is if you step on a BIA scale or bioelectrical impedance scale and, and you're dehydrated, your body fat percentage is probably going to be pretty low relative to what it normally is. And then let's say you step off that scale, you house down 60 ounces of, of, of water and step back on the scale 30 seconds or a minute later. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if your body fat percentage went up by, by 3 to 5% uh, or more. And if you're stepping on that scale every day and, you know, half of the time or some of the time you're hydrated, and some of the time you're not, some of the time you're doing it in the evening, some of the time you're doing it in the morning, you're not going to be able to, to get an accurate represent, representation of how your body fat percentage fluctuates over time. And this same concept holds true for anything else. So standardizing the collection process can go a long way regardless of the type of measure you're collecting. And in the BIA uh, example, you know, if you have a routine where you wake up, um, you know, you brush your teeth, um, you drink one bottle of water and you step on the scale and that's kind of your routine and you do that every time, then the results become a lot more reliable and you can actually use them to understand what's going on longitudinally. Uh, that was, and th I think that's all I got. So thanks so much for listening and watching and um, I'll see you in the next one.